Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna keep on going. Heidegger and Letter on Humanism. Um, so where we left off, um, over the next couple of paragraphs, Heidegger's really trying to drive home the idea that we are attempting to, you know, recover, you know, what, what is forgotten um, and that is being, and how it is something, you know, that, that it's always in, in danger of, of oblivion. Um, you know, and, and that is the, the forgetting of the question of being, as well as the, um, you know, no sense of, of, of us and, and, and our own, you know, on our own essence within the, the clearing of, of being, you know, like using so to speak, the, the, the da, the there of our, of our very own being as sort of the, the site, the activity, um, you know, that, 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 that if we can attune ourselves in and through that, um, that, that, that place, um, that situation, um, that we can, you know, perhaps ask these important uh, questions that Help us to remember being. Help us to, you know, know what it is that's that's really going on with us. You know, where it's, it's bringing it into the our this this care structure um, that's so that you know that was like the big one of the big things going on in, in his in his in his you know, big work being in time. Um, and he's he wants to contrast that with what's going on with Sartre. And so if you skip ahead a couple paragraphs, he says by way of contrast, Sartre expresses the basic tenet of existentialism in this way. Existence precedes essence. We've read about that. We've talked about that. In this statement, he's taking extensia and essentia according to their metaphysical meaning, which from Plato's time on has said that um, essence precedes existence. Sartre reverses this statement, but the reversal of a metaphysical statement remains a metaphysical statement, and that's that's Heidegger's uh, one of his main beefs with Sartre and with existentialism, that it's simply an inversion that still is falling prey to metaphysical conceptualizations and thinkings. Um, uh, what he, what, with it, he stays with metaphysics in oblivion of the truth of being, right? And this is, this is one of the reasons, perhaps the, the main reason why um, existentialism, um, you know, is is not a for Heidegger a, a a true philosophical way of of thinking. It doesn't proceed with you know the phenomenological ontological priority that you know that Heidegger thinks that one should start with. Again, because it it takes it takes a a, a point of view. It it take within metaphysics. It takes uh, it takes regional concerns. Like the other isms do, and sort of proceeds without right or justification, you know, into those things as being of, of primary importance, of, of like having an agenda before you know what's really going on. Um, if you talk down to the next paragraph, he says Sartre's key proposition about the priority of existence over essence does, however, justify using the name existentialism. Um, as an appropriate title for a philosophy of this sort, but the basic tenet of existentialism has nothing at all in common with the statement from being in time. Um, so, you know, he's saying it very clearly here how it's not like a, a furthering of what he laid out in being in time. Apart from the fact that in being in time, no statement about the relation of uh, essence and existence can yet be expressed. Since there is still a question of preparing something precursory, so like if you, you know, if you read *Being in Time*, you know, um, much about it is meant is meant to be understood as preparatory analysis. That you know, it's 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 Heidegger laying the groundwork um, to undertake uh, this question to sort of retrieve this question from the Greeks. You know, what is the meaning of being? Um, but but to take it as something more than preparatory, um, as I believe he's saying, you know, Sartre and the existentialists do, um, it's just, uh, it's incorrect. Um, let's see. 
He talks more about substance, uh, relating it to Uzia, um, and about what's present. Um, he's problematizing all of this stuff. Um, but if you look down near the end of the next paragraph, he says, uh, let's see, rather the sole implication is that the highest determinations of the essence of the human being and humanism still do not realize the proper dignity of the human being. To that extent, the thinking and being in time is against humanism. But this opposition does not mean that such thinking aligns itself with the humane and advocates the inhuman, that it promotes the inhumane and deprecates the dignity of the human being. Humanism, humanism is opposed because it does not set the humanitas of the human being high enough. It, while, like what, what, he is 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 sort of um, potentially being accused of, or at least what what he's advocating is being, you know, in, like in danger of 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 um, championing the the inhumane, the lack of dignity of the human being. But you know, but humanism does. He says, you know, that that that, that is not the case. Um, if, if anything, humanism, as it's metaphysically conceived um, by his analysis, it it doesn't dignify human beings enough. Um, again, because of the sort of special place that that the thinker, the you know the the one who is used by language, the one that is you know sort of thrust and into stands out into um, being and and is is able to have this relationship with the truth of being like that. That's not something that you're going to get. With humanism as it is, you know, traditionally uh, conceived. Um, next paragraph, he says the human being is rather thrown by being into the truth of being, so that existing in this fashion, he might guard the truth of being in order that beings might appear in the light of being, as the beings they are. Human beings do not decide whether and how beings appear whether and how God and the gods or history and nature come forward into the clearing of being, come to presence and depart. The advent of being lies in the destiny of being. But for human being, but for humans, it is ever a question of finding what is fitting in their essence that corresponds to such destiny. Um, for in accord with this destiny, the human being as existing has to guard the truth of being. The human being is the shepherd of being. Uh, and so, and so, um, what I want to get at there is, if it, with existentialism, it's all about choices, and it's all about the prior prioritization of choices that then have this sort of like, you know, um, I, I want to say retroactive, but but they have this fashioning effect upon whatever we are essentially. Heidegger saying it's it's not it's not about it's not about this like we don't have that much agency what 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 is given to us to do is is more profound than that like that's fundamentally he thinks incorrect um, but but our our shepherding and our taking care of being and and our sort of uh, ability to know and I'll say proclaim the truth of being um, to live in the truth of being is something that all of those choices and all those sort of you know lifestyle habituations um you know various sort of uh, meaning infused projects that we undertake these don't get at this you know this this sort of humbling but glor like you know this this glorious uh, if, if you will this awesome um responsibility of being uh, the shepherd of being, um, one used by language, one given over to thinking of and for being. Um, he says, next paragraph, yet being, what is being? It is, it itself. The thinking that is to come must learn to experience that and, and to say it. Being, that is not God and not a cosmic ground. Being is essentially farther and all beings and is yet nearer to the human being than every being, be it a rock, a beast, a work of art, a machine, 
be it an angel or God, being is the nearest, yet the near remains farthest from the human being. Human beings are uh, human beings at first cling always and only to beings, but when thinking represents beings as beings, it no doubt relates itself to being. In truth, however, it is all it always thinks only of beings as such, precisely not and never being as such. Um, so getting a couple things that will come up again later, and we've already you know, touched on them, and that is being is the closest and the farthest thing away from us. Um, you know, it, we, we, are, we are being, but only as distinct beings. We, on, we only are like, you know, the, the da, that, that's us. But being is, is, is more than that. Um, but, be, but because of the particular limitations of, you know, the finite condition, because of our, you know, the limits of our thought, um, the, the, the limits um, of our particular pathologies, if you will, the particular limits of our culture, the particular limits of, I mean, just think of all the things that you can think of, that, you know, we, we so often sort of get turned around in our thinking, or we get turned around in like what it is that we're undertaking, um, the way that, you know, our, our casual our, our casual attitudes and practices regarding thinking and speaking, um, ways that we undertake to live, that 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 really that's really causing us to 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 forget being and not pay heed to being, and so it's so far, and yet it's 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 right here, you know, here it is with us, and this is what Heidegger is trying to get. He's trying to get us really aware and, and get us like really activated when it comes to a, a much more intentional posture about letting being sort of you know overtake us uh, and, and really so that we can have this awe infused wonder infused you know way of, of, of being in the world so that, that everything just in my sense of what he's saying here like it it starts to be what it really is and being what it really is, it starts to matter so much more. And it's not just like things that I think um, in relationship to my to my own being. That's, that's like the starting place, right? Like I start from this situation, but it's not just all this sort of relativistic and subjective sense of things only matter to me to the degree that they are playing in as factors into my limited view of the world. Um, I mean, that's the great danger, I think, by doing this existential phenomenology is it just sort of gets reduced to a, a subjective attunement. But, but I think that for Heidegger, that's like a starting place that opens up something that's, that's much more, I'll say universal, it's a little bit dangerous <laughs> in, Heidegger, in Heidegger talk. Um, but he is much more concerned with, with I'll say, the big picture of, of being. And I'll use the word again, picture, in, in scare quotes, um, because we don't we don't want our thinking to be too representational and too imagistic. Um, okay, um, and he goes on to talk about metaphysical representation uh, as something we need to problematize. And it, you know, and if it's not already clear, I mean, one of, one of the difficulties in 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 reading Heidegger and thinking about Heidegger, writing about Heidegger is you know, using words to clarify what, what he's saying, that then uh, in the act of clarifying it and trying to, you know, to relate it, is that you end up doing like this interpretive um, damage uh, to what it is that he's, you know, very carefully hermeneutically, you know, trying to sort of unpack um, these questions, these thoughts, um, you know, his own insights. Um, let's see here. Let's go... Let's see, let's uh, skip a paragraph. He says, but how provided we really ought to ask such a question at all? How does being relate to existence? Being itself is the relation to the extent that it, as the locality of the truth of being amid beings, gathers to itself and embraces existence in its existential, that is, ecstatic essence. Because the human being, as the one who exists, comes to stand in this relation that being destines for itself 
and that he ecstatically sustains it, that is, in care, um, takes it upon himself, he at first fails to recognize the nearness, the nearest, and attaches himself to the next nearest. He even thinks that this is the nearest, but nearer than the nearest in beings, at the same time for ordinary thinking, farther than the farthest is nearness itself, the truth of being. Um, and, and then he's going to go on to the next paragraph to talk about authenticity and in, inauthenticity um, in, in relationship to um, what's, what's concealed and what's revealed, the ecstatic relation, the truth of being. Um, and, and I think that, I think that what he's getting at in terms of what we read here, um, we're, we're going to have this tendency to, to end up not thinking being and thinking the truth of being, but rather we're going to think in relation to like that which is the next closest proximity to us. And, and that would be, I believe, um, our own being and the sort of the at hand world uh, around us. Now, which is not to say that we're not, that we're to avoid thinking through our own particular, you know, uh, place, lo locality, our own situation, our own throne existence. I mean, I, I think that, I think that that's, 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 that is where we start, right? As we were saying earlier. Um, but I think that the, the, where it gets, where we have to start getting really careful is we need to not confuse the there of our being with being itself. And so we don't want a fundamental ontology that is really just an existentialism in which everything is in reference only to our own being. That's, that's, that's where we start. It's kind of like our access point. You know, the language that we're given, the historical, you know, situation of our being, the culture of our being, the, 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 the surrounding world of our being, the people that we're with, I mean, so, so many different things. But that all of, all of this is, you know, where we're, where we're beginning so that we can get to this actual thinking of and for being itself. And so, and so we don't want it to, we don't want to fall prey to existentialism or to a humanism or to a Marxism or to a Christianity that, you know, is going to replace the thinking of and for being with something else, with, with human essence um, or, or with um, liberation or with salvation, something like that. Um, okay. Now, let's go. He goes on to, um, if you skip a paragraph, the one that I said talks about authenticity and inauthenticity, the next paragraph, um, he says, the one that begins, uh, the one thing thinking would like to attain for the first time tries to articulate in being a time as something simple as such being remains mysterious. I think at this point that's pretty clear. <laughs> It's clear, it's clear that it's mysterious. Um, the simple nearness of an unobtrusive prevailing. The nearness occurs essentially as language itself. That's the nearness. That, that, that's that, 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 that super close proximity to being is, is the language that we're, you know, that we're in, right? And if we view it as some sort of tool that we use as a mode of expression or as a, you know, a, a system of communication, any, any of those things have a degree of correctness, a you know, degree of you know, like, you know, they're useful conceptions, but that they, they, don't, they don't get at what Heidegger sees as, as the, the relationship of you know, logos to physis, that this is something that's much more primal, it's much more original in the human being, you know, being a being that that is that is have that has this sort of special, uncanny, homely and, and, and not at home relationship with the world, is that we 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 are in the world as as sh shepherds um, of and for being that are using language 
again, it's hard to avoid using the type of language he wants us to avoid using, um, in such a way as to as to preserve being and being's truth in this in this house of being, which, which language is, um, because it controls like how we understand being and you know how how it controls how we're using things, how we're seeing things, our our attitudes towards things. Um, okay, let's see. Um, trying to see how far ahead we can skip here. Um, so obviously we can't read every single page of this thing. Um, so let's go. Let's skip ahead. One, two, three, four, five. Skip ahead six paragraphs. And let's go to the paragraph that begins uh, the introductory definition. And if you drop a few sentences into that, he says, it is far from the arrogant presumption that wishes to begin anew and declares all past philosophy false. Um, the, the way of thinking that he's trying to talk about here, because it because he's because it's so destructive in a lot of ways, because it's so trying to overcome the tradition. Um, but whether the definition of being as as the transcendence, pure and simple, um, really does name the simple essence of the truth of being. This and this alone is the primary question for a thinking that attempts, which he's attempting, to think the truth of being. That is why we also say that how being is is to be understood chiefly from its meaning. All right, this is this is the hermeneutic element here. Um, that is, you know, the interpretive, right? Um, that is from the truth of being. Being is cleared for the human being in ecstatic projection, but this projection does not create being. Um, yeah. Um, and he's going to go on to talk about Nietzsche here, rightfully so, especially the emphasis that Nietzsche puts on interpretation, you know, all the way down. Um, that that that, that it, this isn't this isn't some simple bypassing of the tradition, um, you know, as, as he says. This is far from the arrogant presumption. It wants to say all philosophies is false. Rather. You know, we're trying to understand what the task of philosophy really is. And one of the things that we have to understand is that what, what it is that we are capable to, to, to do as thinkers and, and those that are used by language or are attuned to language in a specific way is that we can deal with meaning. We can deal with what things are in terms of their significance. That this is sort of the real gift of, of this attunement to language is the, the it, it, I want to say the determination of meaning, but I want to be a little bit more careful and say that we are able to discern um, what things what things mean. What, you know, if we, if we were going to say their true value, um, not value in the sense that he's trying to get away from, but, but what things what things really are in as much as what they really mean uh, to us within um, within the situation that we find ourselves in this attunement to language, which is this attunement to being. Um, he goes on to say in the next paragraph, um, about halfway through it, he says, Nietzsche was the last to experience this, this homelessness. Um, and, and, and again, um, this... Let me back up a little bit. He says um, regarding homeland, and, and there's a lot here going on about homeland. I mean, you know, thinking back to the 20th century and um, the world wars of, of Heidegger's philosophy in relationship to, um, you know, a, a national cultural identity. Um, Thinking in, in terms of you know what it what it means to dwell all that all that kind of stuff, um, 
And I, and I don't want to like gloss over that stuff. That stuff's important, but I, I kind of want to get to what's what he's trying to argue here. Um, he says, um, in the lecture on Hertelin's elegy, Homecoming, this nearness of being, which the da Dasein is, is thought on the basis of being in time, is perceived as spoken from the minstrel's poem. From the experience of the oblivion of being, it is called the homeland. Um, the word is thought here in an essential sense, not patriotically or nationalistically, but in terms of the history of being. The essence of homeland, however, is also mentioned with the intention of thinking the homelessness of contemporary human beings from the essence of being's history. Now where we started, Nietzsche was the last to experience this homelessness. Far from within metaphysics, he was unable to find any other way out than a reversal in metaphysics. I mean, you know, Nietzsche going from, um, you know, like if you read early writings by Nietzsche, um, there is this sense of, you know, strength and power understood as being part of a state and that a state is a war-making machine and that one's existence can be essentially justified um, if they are, you know, appropriated, whether they give themselves over to it or they're forced to do it as helping this war machine to happen. You know, a, a very much beneficial effect is, of course, culture creation through the arts, um, that, that's sort of, sort of the fruit of a, of, a, of, a, of a culture, of a state, but that the state itself exists primarily to sort of fertilize uh, the ground of culture with, with the blood of its war making. Um, and, and Nietzsche sort of, you know, uh, being the classical philologist that he was and his appreciation for the ancient, you know, uh, Greeks, um, he's very much um, embracing that and, and seeing how it can apply to, you know, uh, con contemporary affairs. And I think he loses his, um, he, he, I think, grows out of that position and, and becomes um, more cosmopolitan and he thinks more in terms of, you know, Europe and not so much like the greatness of, of, of Germany. Um, but Heidegger's pointing out that, you know, his record, like he fell prey to kind of what Sartre fell prey to, and that is just an attempt to like invert the metaphysics, um, you know, uh, um, the metaphysics, like the, whatever, whatever problems he's addressing, it was, it was just sort of flipping it on its head, which is effective, but for Heidegger still doesn't allow for, you know, the, the escape from that, that unhelpful sense of metaphysics. Um, he says, from within metaphysics, he was unable to find any other way out than a reversal of metaphysics, but um, that is the height of futility. On the other hand, when, when Hertelin, this is you know, a poet that Heidegger writes a lot about, um, really, you know, um, if you don't know Hertelin, um, he's, a, he's a really influential uh, poet in, in, you know, um, in Germany. I mean, I, I don't know that, um, obviously he's not as well known outside of, of Germany, and I, I don't know what his current location is in the German cultural canon, to be, to be honest, but, but definitely they're, they're, uh, he's definitely considered uh, by people who are reading Heidegger, um, to be really influential. And, and if you know, you know, sort of German romanticism, he's, he's also a really prominent figure um, there as well. Um, anyways, he says, when Hertelin composes Homecoming, uh, the poem, he is concerned that his countrymen find their essence. He does not at all seek that essence in an egoism of his people, right? He sees it rather in the context of a belongingness to the destiny of the West. But even the West is not thought regionally as the Occident in contrast to the Orient, nor merely as Europe, but rather world historically out of nearness to the source. We, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot going on here, but, uh, but Heidegger's really, you know, trying to talk about how others like Nietzsche, like Hertelin have, you know, like really we're struggling to 
to bring forth um, some sort of version of the history of, of, of being that played into how it is that, a, that a, a people could dwell authentically and poetically and, you know, sort of be attuned to all the things that they should be attuned to and doing what it is that they were supposed to do. And, you know, one of the risks is falling prey to a nationalism, falling prey to like a sort of, you know, uh, a psychology. And, and then you're not really doing the sort of like, I'll call it the ontological work, you know, the poetic work that, that Heidegger is, you know, uh, wanting, wanting to champion. Um, let's see. Um, let's go to the next paragraph. He says, uh, in such nearness, if at all, the decision may be made as to whether and how God and the gods withhold their presence. And, and again, the degree to which you're familiar with, with Hurdlin, I think would be really helpful here, Alberta would be helpful here. But even if you're not, I think we can still get something out of this. Um, uh, God and the gods withhold their presence and the night remains, whether and how the day uh, of the holy dawns, whether and how the upsurgence of the holy and, and epiphany of God and the gods be, can begin anew. But the holy, which alone is the essential sphere of divinity, which in turn alone affords a dimension for the gods and for God, comes to radiate only when being itself beforehand and after extensive preparation has been cleared and is experienced in its truth. Only thus does the overcoming of homelessness um, begin from being. A homelessness in which not only human beings, but the essence of the human being stumbles aimlessly about. Next paragraph. Homelessness so understood consists in the abandonment of beings by being. Homelessness is the symptom of oblivion of being. Next paragraph. As the destiny that sends truth, being remains concealed, but the destiny of world is heralded in poetry. Without yet becoming manifest in the history of being, the world historical thinking of Hurdlin that speaks out in the poem Remembrance is therefore essentially more primordial and thus more significant for the future than the mere cosmopolitanism of Goethe. Next paragraph. Homelessness is coming to be the destiny of the world. Um, and yeah, one of the outcomes um, of the metaphysical thinking that Heidegger is taking aim at, again, that, that, that has resulted in all these different isms, um, one, of, one, of, one of the results is homelessness. And we normally use that term, obviously, for you know, unhoused people, people that you know, don't have a roof over their head. They're transient, right? Homelessness that he's talking about here is is people not feeling at home in the world, that they are estranged and they are alienated. You know, so like Marx, right? Marx picks up on this. But of course, for Heidegger, you know, he's still falling prey to a, you know, a, a metaphysically induced ism that only has him uh, addressing a particular, you know, aspect, like what we might even say something like he's not addressing the fundamental issue that results in the alienation. Um, we might make the same case about Freud. We might make the same case about Sartre, that anybody that, you know, is dealing with some variation of the idea of homelessness, alienation, estrangement, um, aren't doing what it is that Heidegger is, is putting forward, and that is addressing themselves to being, and the question of being, and the truth of being, right? Um, you know, if they do that, then, 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 then they can remember, then they can, you know, sort of come back home uh, to being, uh, as, it, as it were. Um, and this idea, you know, and, and Hertelin, uh, the poet, you know, writes, writes so, so beautifully and exquisitely about this, is that, you know, the gods have, the gods have fled and, and they've abandoned us, right? And you can think to, you know, Nietzsche's aphorism 125 from uh, the gay science and the death of God, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not like a choice that you live in the 21st century, um, you know, in, in which, um, like, you can, choose, you can choose to be religious or not, or not religious, right? And, and that somehow, like, has any bearing about what he's talking about here. 
this is that living in the time that we live in, like the gods aren't present with us anymore. They're not present in our cultural activities. Like everybody is existing in the same like prioritization of inauthentic modes of existence. Like we're economically driven, we're concerned more with success and with popularity. We're not asking philosophical questions. We make certain psychological and biological assumptions about the essence of the human being and so on and so forth. And so we're not really tuning ourselves and addressing the things that we need to be. We're not, we're not able to let being be and to claim us and to like allow language to speak through us so that we ask the questions and make the preserving statements. Um, you know, we don't care for poetry. Um, and, 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 it, and it's like ability to sort of like really speak for being in a way that normal prosaic language uh, it, you know, doesn't do, that, that hides us, that, 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 our, that our current destiny is oblivion, is, is like homelessness, no sense of place or purpose, um, and that, you know, the being will be forgotten, and, and what will we be but these sort of, um, you know, husks of people um, that just sort of move about uh doing whatever it is that that the herd does whatever it is that you know more these these external dominating powers you know um do to us would have us do um and it can be even more insidious than that um in any case uh yeah i think i think i'll end it on that um i'll just read one other thing he says the last thing I read was homelessness is coming to be the destiny of the world. Hence, it is necessary to think that destiny in terms of the history of being, what Marx recognized in an essential and significant sense, uh, though derived from Hegel as the estrangement of the human being, has its roots in the homelessness of modern human beings. This homelessness is specifically evoked from the destiny of being in the form of metaphysics, and through metaphysics is simultaneously entrenched and covered up as such, because Marx, by experiencing estrangement, attains an essential dimension of history. The Marxist view of history is superior to that of other historical accounts, because it does recognize at least like the problem, part of the problem, or at least in a particular way. But since neither Husserl nor, as far as I have seen till now, Sartre recognizes the essential importance of the historical in being, neither phenomenologically, um, neither phenomenology nor existentialism enters that dimension within which a productive dialogue with Marxism uh, first becomes possible. Um, so like he's recognizing uh, Marx's importance, um, problems with uh, traditional phenomenology vis-a-vis -vis Husserl, existentialism vis-a-vis -vis Sartre, um, but that, that, that we could see phenomenology, like Heidegger's, you know, like his existential phenomenology as the philosophy. Um, we can, we can, see how it might be linked up with Marxism to do something really, um, you know, important, uh, accurate. Um, but as of yet, at the time of writing this, he, he hadn't seen it happen. In any case, um, I'll go ahead and pause here. Um, there's still a lot to cover, clearly. Uh, so the next video is going to be one where I, I really try to um, get through some passages really quickly. Oh, I hope this was of use to you. Um, until next time, keep reading and uh, keep thinking.